Hi, this is Kendrick with worldmedicalschool.org. We're going to talk about asthma. Asthma is characterized by, we think about coughing and wheezing, which is kind of the symptoms of it. And that coughing and wheezing is caused by air flam inflam airway inflammation, hyper-responsiveness of the smooth muscle, and uh, obstruction of airflow. Now, this wasn't always our understanding of it. In fact, it's only been the last 20 years that we really realized how airway inflammation played a factor in this. Before that, people thought of it as primarily a hyper-responsiveness of the smooth muscle, and before that, they thought of it as more of a psychiatric illness. Hippocrates is, is one of the first to talk about asthma as a condition, and he characterized it as, a, as basically a mental problem, and it was really treated as such until the not-so-distant uh, past so um, we've come a long way in the last 20 years, though. So a lot of people get this. Uh, even uh, famous people like Li Elizabeth Taylor, uh, great saxophonists like uh, Bill Clinton, and even some really smart people get it, too, uh, like Beethoven over here. But about 7-10% to of people in the world get it, and a little bit more here in the U.S. And we'll talk about why there might be more in the U.S., and in other first world countries. But uh, it's interesting to note that there's over 250,000 deaths worldwide. And if that number were consistent with U.S. numbers, that would mean we'd be getting like 25,000 deaths in the U.S. a year. But we only get 184. And that's a number from 2004. So, so obviously we're doing something to uh, prevent death from asthma but uh, we're doing something else that encourages or, or uh, predisposes to asthma. So we talk about two different phases in the pathophysiology of asthma in this inflammatory process. The first phase is when something binds to this IgE, some kind of uh, antigen uh, like, a, like an allergen binds to an IgE which is uh, bound to a mast cell and then you get this cytokine cascade. So the cytokines among them are the big one that we think about is histamine coming out of the mast cells. The histamine causes uh, this uh, airway uh, constriction and that's what causes our, our obstruction. But the cytokines that also come out of the mast cells uh, include the, uh, cytokines that recruit other inflammatory cells like helper T cells and then the helper T cells help to recruit more inflammatory cells. So you get helper T, zeosinophils, uh, basophils, neutrophils, all these cells are coming into this area. They're all releasing their own cytokines and this is just making uh, more inflammation and it's going to also cause more bronchoconstriction. So um, that's what happens in the in the early and late phase, and then as a result of this chronic inflammation, then you get the airway remodeling, which includes uh, mucus gland hyperplasia. So we're getting more mucus glands, we're getting more smooth muscle, we're going to get a thickened basement membrane and fibrosis uh, underneath the basement membrane, and then later on we get angiogenesis, where we get new blood vessel growth in the area. And all of these things cause, uh, uh, just sets you up in the in the long term for uh, more uh, pulmonary problems. So the real physics of this is that we're going to be pushing less air out in less time. So this graph here shows uh, expiration and shows how fast we're blowing it out. As we're bl as we're getting down to uh, zero volume, so uh, these numbers here at the bottom represent how much air we've actually blown out. And this, if we're going to say this is a normal graph, then an asthmatic is going to blow air out more slowly along this drastically exaggerated. Um, less steep curve here and it's also going to have a little bit higher lung volume because of the obstruction and so uh, this is uh, 
what causes our problem is we just we can't get the air out as fast and the most important number on here is this FEV1 which is the amount of air blown out in one second so if we're gonna do this uh, FEV1 for the asthmatic it's gonna be less air blown out in one second so the risk factors include uh, atopy which is basically a predisposition to type 1 hypersensitivity disorders, including eczema and, and other uh, allergic problems. So 80% of uh, eczema patients uh, have some type of asthma. There's over 100 genes that affect asthma. And then smoke exposure is one of the biggest uh, controllable risk factors. Now this next point is interesting to me because I have a little boy who got RSV uh, when he was about, a, let's see, he was just a, just over a year when he got RSV and he had some significant wheezing with it. So I was naturally thinking, okay, is this going to lead to asthma? Well, about a third of kids wheeze in their first year and 80% of those aren't going to uh, have asthma after their first year. They're not going to wheeze after um after age three, but um, but there is a increase in asthma with kids who wheeze with RSV. But we don't know for sure though if that's a causal relationship, meaning that the RSV causes you to have asthma, or if you're just more likely to wheeze if you are predisposed to asthma and then you get RSV. So the the jury's still out on that one. Antibiotic use is another risk factor, and I told you we were going to talk about why industrialized or uh, westernized countries um, have let have a greater number of as asthma patients. And the the theory is called the hygiene hypothesis, which kind of in a in a simplified way says that we have less stuff for our immune systems to fight, so they kind of just uh, fight whatever they can, and uh, that's where we get this increased inflammation. And uh, they're still working on that. So, and then uh, volatile organic compounds and some building materials like phthalates are uh, considered risk factors as well, and they're pretty common, and we're still yet to do more research about how much they might play a role. So those were the risk factors. These are the precipitating factors of an actual um, of an allergic exacerbation or a, sorry, an asthmatic exacerbation. And you see smoke is on the list and viral infection is on the list. Um, so these, these can lead to an overall uh, cause of disease, but they, they also can precipitate an exacerbation. So we'll talk about how we'll avoid these later if we want to uh, avoid getting an asthma exacerbation. So most of these kids present before they're five. They wheeze. Um, if, they've been, if they cough seasonally, if they cough at night, or if they cough for more than three weeks at a stretch, that's when we start thinking this might be asthma. It could be intermittent. Uh, it could be a chronic. It could be a morning cough. And um, if it's not an ex exacerbation right now, then you might not see anything on the exam. Um, but it, an important fact here is that it's not typically going to get worse after you're first diagnosed. So 60% of asthmatics resolve by adulthood. The number's a lot lower if it's a severe asthma. But still, it's not likely to get a lot worse once you've uh, got a diagnosis. And there is a high association with GERD, and they've also thought about a uh, possible causal relationship with that too. So on your differential diagnosis, you got to think about allergic rhinitis and sinusitis, both of which can cause you to cough chronically if you have uh, you know that post-nasal drip that's irritating. Uh, irritating the uh, uh, laryngeal area, making you cough. Tracheomalacia is a disorder where you have a uh, floppy cartilage in your trachea. 
that is prone to collapse and shut down the airway and that can cause a similar a similar presentation vascular rings uh, are just uh, just what they just what they said they're congenital abnormalities um, you can get a mass that uh, blocks the airway foreign body GERD like we said can also cause coughing and uh, vocal cord dysfunction is the, something you see in older kids uh, bronchiolitis, cystic fibrosis, heart failure all those obviously can cause coughing so the gold standard in, in diagnosing this is with spirometry so anytime that you give a 12, get a 12 percent increase in FEV1 after you give bronchodilators so you do it once then you uh, do it again after you give bronchodilators then you can call it asthma well what about kids under six years old they're, they're not very good at doing the spirometry so then you gotta rely more on the risk factors like uh, whether or not their parents have it whether or not they've got uh, eczema uh, uh, or other allergy symptoms then uh, uh, that can lead you to a diagnosis of asthma and there's four main categories of severity intermittent mild persistent moderate persistent and severe severe persistent and these categories are based on how impaired you are by it and how much at risk you are um, for serious complications so um, the impairment is going to measure the amount of symptoms, uh, how often uh, you use a short-acting beta agonist, um, but that is uh, that is actually not a criteria. Just the symptoms, pulmonary function, and interference with activity are the real criteria. But the Saba use can can uh, give us some hints. So. I'm not going to go through all these charts for one one reason is because I don't have them memorized and the other reason is that it will take a while but basically you need access to um, to just the basic criteria of uh, how you decide on what stage they're in or what severity category they're in one easy thing to remember is that if it's intermittent if <coughs> excuse me, if it's intermittent, it's not going to interfere much with their activity. Um, if it's mild persistent, it, it will interfere a little bit, and uh, obviously you get more interference as you go along. Another big one is uh, nighttime awakenings. If you've got uh, if you've got a couple nighttime awakenings um, in a month, then you're thinking mild persistent. If you get uh, a nighttime awakening every week, then you're thinking moderate persistent. And um, more than once a week, and you think it's severe persistent. So, and then any of these can, can qualify you for these different categories. So the way we treat it, we want to be careful at first, when, once we have a diagnosis, we want to be careful uh, um, that there's not some kind of an infection involved because you're more prone to infection. Obesity can complicate it, so you want to screen for obesity and, and help uh, alleviate it. Depression often comes with having a, any severe illness, and uh, GERD is a common comorbidity like we talked about. So just check for these things because they often go hand in hand. And then uh, make sure that the parent's not smoking and the kids not smoking obviously but the parent needs to stop smoking we, we told them to stop smoking before and they didn't do it but now they really need to stop smoking and then just avoid all the allergens by keeping the house real clean wash the bedding change the carpet out no pets uh, don't keep a lot of cockroaches in your house and then short-acting beta agonists is our first line of defense as far as a medical treatment so this works in a few minutes, um, albuterol, leave albuterol, pu perbuterol. These uh, are our rescue inhalers. And 
we don't want to be using these more than a couple days a week um, or that that means that we probably should be giving them something more to keep it more controlled. Uh, anticholinergics like ipratropium can also be used here. And then systemic corticosteroids like a, um, like a steroid, uh, any kind of, kind of an oral steroid can be used to help calm down an overall ex exacerbation. So this isn't like in the minutes that you need to catch your breath. This is uh, to keep it from, uh, keep a exacerbation from bothering you over days. And then if you have uh, asthma and it, um, exercise is uh, a problem, then using a short-acting beta agonist or a chrome one 15 to 20 minutes before exercise will help. So the long-term medical treatments are in the inhaled cortical steroids. Make sure to use a spacer and rinse out so you don't get a lot of the side effects. Um, on this list, you have uh, QVAR, Pulmacort, Aerospan, Flovent, Asmonex. All of them work in, in about the same way. And uh, then chromalin is a um, mast cell membrane stabilizer. So this helps both in the early phase and the late phase. And then leukotriene modifiers like uh, monoleucast, zephyrolucast, and xyluton are all helpful. Um, I think in kids under four, you just want to use the monoleucast, but older kids, you can use the, the zephyrolucast and xyluton. And then you use your long-acting beta-2 agonists for more longer-term control. And uh, theophylin, which increases cyclic AMP, can help to uh, decrease smooth muscle uh, contraction. And then um, omalizumab, let's see, and I think the brand name is Zolaire, is an IgE uh, antibody. So it's an anti-IgE antibody. So it prevents IgE from... Uh, binding to mast cells and uh, causing that cytokine cascade. And this is a kind of a guide to use in deciding what stage you're at and what uh, um, what medications you're going to use. So if in the beginning you probably just want to get by with the rescue inhaler and if they and they'll only use it when they have problems. If that's if they're using that a little too often, then you might add the low dose uh, inhaled corticosteroid, and they do it every day to keep uh, the exacerbations away. And then m one of the next steps is to add a leukotriene inhibitor or a leukotriene antagonist, uh, or go up in the dose of your uh, inhaled corticosteroids. And you can read the grid and go up as you go. Um, and uh, this affects, uh, uh, this is used for both initiating therapy with a level of severity and also um, if you are having poor control at whatever, l whatever level of severity you have. Whew, sorry, that was hard for me to get through that. So um, the uh, volume loop was uh, given to us by somebody who goes by Prison Blues, the lung volume, by, by a name I can't pronounce. Thanks for those uh, visual aids. And if you want to help, volunteer at uh, worldmedicalschool.org backslash volunteer. Um, your comments are always welcome to help us improve the videos and uh, share it with others. Thanks.